Who's the director? Is I was no, I, I, even a couple of times ago. I was involved on the Wigan train, ah. but uh, no. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <clears throat> what a good crowd for this time in the morning and in, in all this traffic. Welcome to this uh, session in the round. I'm going to spin around just to get a sense of the room here. It's a bit Shakespearean, isn't it? This uh, yeah. <laughs> the Globe Theatre kind of experience going on here. Um, we're going to record this particular session for broadcast on Channel News Asia next week. So if I do uh, inexplicable things like throw to a break, it's because we're doing it for, for TV purposes. So please bear with us. Um, what we're going to do is open up with our, I'll make a brief introduction to the camera, set the scene for what we're doing, and then we'll pretend it's a live TV show. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and from that point onwards, we can we can carry on and do, do what we're doing. I mean, I, I think there is a, a provision for questions. OK, so we'll, we'll spend about a half hour, 40 minutes chatting amongst ourselves. And then um, hopefully you guys can join in and, and question the panel as much as I do. We're going to treat it as a, something of a free form conversation rather than a question and answer session. Uh, the panel is a very interesting mixture of expertise and experience. Uh, and hopefully they can bring their own individual uh, experience to bear and, and interact with each other, and, and you'll get more out of it from that. So having said all that, let me um, make my introduction to the TV camera, and uh, we'll, we'll kick off the show. I'm standing up because I can look around much better, and I, I think much better when I stand up. So I hope that hopefully that doesn't apply to you guys, so you can... <laughs> but once I've made the introduction, I'll sit down, and, and then we'll, we'll crack on. Hello and welcome to the annual meeting of the new champions here in Tianjin in China, the World Economic Forum's annual gathering for East Asia, the Summer Davos, as they call it. Today, we're going to be talking about Asia's business context. I have with me a distinguished panel of people who will debate their experiences and their expectations for the development of Asia within uh, the, the general strictures of what we're talking about here in Tianjin. Um, I will sit down and introduce them to you individually, and we'll set the scene for our conversation today. I'll begin with Kevin Sneeder of McKinsey. Uh, he's joining us here. Torihiko Kojima of Mitsubishi. Li Kui is with us. Uh, Kaushik Basu of the World Bank and Victor Chu. Uh, I hope each one of you will introduce yourselves much more formally uh, and with greater detail as, as you speak, uh, and we'll lay the context. Now, we're talking Asia's business context, and it's a very general topic to begin with. So perhaps the best thing that we could do is try and define what that actually means to each one of you from your perspectives and your experience as to how you see the context and where you think it's going. Because as we wake up this morning, President Obama uh, is speaking again about the threat of ISIS. ISIS has already spoken about the threat it intends to pose in various countries in Asia. Uh, we have a, a poll showing that the relations between Japan and China, at least in the minds of their citizens uh, have worsened, and that kind of uh, rivalry seems to be getting worse. The ASEAN economic community is supposed to start next year, and we hear that businesses are getting very worried about whether that will deliver what it promises to deliver, uh, and whether it will be successful in the manner that the politicians hope it will be. So there are any number of areas we can go with this context, and I'd like to hear from you as to which are the important and the crucial ones for the future. So I'll stop talking and ask Victor to begin. Victor, the context uh, of where we are now to you means what? And, and what should we be discussing at this forum? I think if you look around the world, I mean, Asia is still a oasis for investors. I mean, with uh, high growth relative to the rest of the world, we have huge potential, you know, with different Asian economies working with each other, as you say, the ASEAN economic community coming in. But at the same time, we have also huge challenges. The 
the um, triangular relationship between China, Japan, and Korea it needs um, a lot of work to to get back onto normalization. The new uh, pr uh, presidency in Indonesia, uh, Singapore coming to its 50th uh, anniversary, China, you know, uh, now still enjoying relatively high growth, but obviously huge uh, domestic um, uh, uh, challenges too. So I think Japan uh, with Abenomics uh, coming back to everybody's radar screen. So I'm very excited about Asia, but there are things that we need to work and double our efforts. Bangkok emerging from uh, military into uh, quasi-civilian administration, how would that uh, manifest itself going forward? So I think we are a extremely interesting uh, subject and if we, if we make it work, uh, we will be, um, we'll be the envy of the world in the, really the next five years. Make it a bit more personal for a second, if you mm. could. I mean, from your own experience in business, in, in politics, in being part of the Asian community, tell, us, tell the audience a bit about yourself and what drives you in this context. I think um, in this time of history, I'm very pleased and proud to be Asian. And um, we are, um, you know, China, provide a huge market, India provide a huge market, ASEAN economic community, China, India, ASEAN, you know, we are, we are talking about uh, almost uh, three and a half billion plus uh, consumers and rising middle classes. Um, we as a firm are big investors in China, but we're also we are big investors now in Japan, in Indonesia, in Thailand, as well as in Singapore. So what's happening in Asia and within Asia is of enormous interest to us. And we are in also investing now heavily in Europe and trying to bring European companies into the Asian market, but also helping Asian companies, particularly those in China, as they invest abroad. Kaushik, the World Bank. The World Bank, I suppose, is a generic term, but I think most people will see it as a Western organization. Uh, you have a foot in both camps, I suppose. Uh, West and East. Uh, explain to us what you see today. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, today globally, I mean, if you're looking at the, at the range of things happening, is dreadful, as you pointed out in the beginning. Bad news, war, battle, all kinds of risks all over. In fact, what earlier one used to do with horror films, occasionally you feel like switching off. Occasionally with the news now, you feel like really switching it off and look the other way because it's so bad. In that global scenario, I have to second what Victor um, said just now, that this is a bit of a large oasis, Asia, with all its, there are many troubles, many problems, but despite that, when it comes to the global economy, the hope, a lot of hope resides with Asia. There are also risks and dangers. Asia is a very motley group. In fact, at one level, there are parts of Asia which are wealthy and well-organized like uh, Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, parts are poor, like Sub-Saharan Africa. You put it all together and that's what Asia is. And the experiment with economic policy also is really a range. China, I can tell you if China with its regular, pol the policies that China followed, if China did not grow at all, economists would have told you we could have predicted that. The fact that they could have predicted that means that economic theory is not quite up to the challenge of what China has done, which is a phenomenal growth over a 30-year period. Even in the global scenario now, this region is becoming important because first, of course, there was uh, Japan, Singapore, then later on China comes in. India, for a long time, was a very slow growth region, right up to 1990. In fact, the joke in India used to be that India's growth rate is written in the scriptures of the land. <laughs> So it's immune to economic policy. Uh, but from 1994, India takes off. And from 2005, India is growing at rates above 9%, which was really unthinkable. So this is a region with a lot of growth and potential. And even with the slowdown, the slowdown ha has hit all these countries. From 2008, 2009, you can feel it. But even with the slowdown, China, with the slowdown, is at 7.5% or so, rough growth. Indonesia, which actually did very well through this period, has slowed down now. It was relying a lot on commodities, and that slowed it down. India, for me, the most telltale was 
about a year ago on a television in India, the interviewer said, what's happening to the country? It's going to the dogs. Growth is down to 5%. That shows a change in yardstick, which even 15 years ago, that sentence wouldn't make any sense. So this region has changed with a huge amount of global responsibility because Africa has stirred. And over the last five, 10 years, you're seeing a lot of growth in Africa. But if you dissect it, a major part of that is actually the linkage with Asia today, primarily China. That link is getting that region growing. So there's a lot of hope resides on this in this turbulent world. So we have to just keep it together. And there are some challenges. Maybe I'll come back to some of those and later. Just very quickly, though, within the context, and I suspect that your framework of analysis is maybe more disciplined because of uh, the organization for which you work. Out of all of that, what do you think is the most significant element determining um, the growth of Asia in this context? I mean, you're, you're, you're accentuating the positive. But what are, what are the things that you see as being the important elements? You know, the initial uh, takeoff of Asia, um, uh, Japan, Singapore, uh, China, a lot of it is driven by very standard textbook uh, driver. Investment and savings was the initial driver. But once a country begins to do reasonably well, you can't rely on that. It has to be innovation and innovative activity. This is picking up in Asia. South Korea is doing actually very well on that. Japan has done well on that. China is beginning to invest in that. So I feel in the next round, the driver has to be innovative activity research. And that's going to be a bit of a challenge for this region, because that was not the original driver for Asia. Li Daqui, David, you sit at Tsinghua University. Um, and I suspect your academic perspective and how your students uh, are responding and demanding from you um, direction and leadership. What do you see from, from your position there within China uh, as being the important parts? And particularly, I'm interested to know what you think about uh, Li Keqiang's speech yesterday uh, and the emphasis on innovation that Kaushik mentions. We hear it every day now in Asia. Well, I think Asia, to begin with, Asia is a very, actually, big concept, larger than we often think. Asia covers from Japan, China, all the way to um, Turkey, right? So we are talking about huge context. So for this whole area, a huge part is now challenged because of security issues. That's the Western part of uh, Asia, right? That, let's put aside. For the rest of Asia, I think two themes are interplaying with each other. One theme is the global financial crisis. As with all crises in human history, initially when the crisis hit, people were panic. But very soon, people realized not so bad, not so bad as in almost all countries in the world. By 2009 and 2010, most economies began to recover. And that's the case for India, that's the case for China and many other countries in this region. However, hard work began to kick in five years after the global financial crisis. Each country is facing the aftermath of the financial crisis and the fundamental causes of the financial crisis. So every country is working hard, doing its homework, trying to deal with the problems. In India, they are working on structural problems, right? Taking away uh, impediments to investments and the deficits, the budgetary deficit and the current account deficit. In China, of course, we all, we all know that the old engines of growth, relying upon property market, relying upon export, have to be replaced by new engines of growth. And innovation is one of the drivers of the new engines of growth. So on top of that, they are, um, there's another theme which is interplaying with this, the first one. That is the uh, emergence of China. China, remind us, four years ago, just surpassed Japan as the second largest economy. Now, if you remember, it's almost twice as large as the Japanese economy, either end of this year or next year. This is amazing. So this big and emerging economy is taking room naturally in various, various dimensions, various arena. Naturally, the whole structure, the power balance uh, has to be adjusted. However, the problem is the US, the Americans, oftentimes are, I think, overly worried about the consequences of the increase of the size of China. 
and our neighbors, including Japan, are also very concerned. And that's a source of conflicts in this region. So these two themes, I think, are interplaying with each other, making issues very complicated and interesting from the academic perspective. Very realistic perspective, too. Thank you for that. Pick up on a couple of those things in a moment. Kojima-san, chairman of the board of Mitsubishi Corporation. Your focus is on um, trading and on investment in, in, in the area. Uh, explain to us what, what, to you, are the important elements here. Well, uh, our company, Mitsubishi Corporation, used to be uh, just a trading company. But uh, now the business model is changing because the business circumstance in the world is now changing. Therefore, now the, uh, our company's uh, trading profit is just 20%, and 80% is coming from the investment. But uh, we invest not only money, but also human resources. We send the, uh, our people for the CEO or managing level of our subsidiary companies. That's very, very important. And uh, also, we have uh, also 200 offices in 90 countries throughout the world. Therefore, we can analyze what will be happening next. Therefore. Based upon that, we are changing our business model. Then talking about Asia, and uh, I like to talk about uh, India and ASEAN and China. But uh, uh, it will take some more time, but later on I will exchange you know, a comment. But uh, India is concerned. And uh, a new uh, premier, Mr. Modi, visited Japan in the last week, and uh, he said he will change the India. And uh, that was very much uh, impressed. Uh, and his comment was very good. Then uh, I felt that uh, we have uh, so many chances to develop more business in India. You may know India's problem is state by state, regulation and the tax system is changing, it's different. Now he likes to control everything by himself. And if that is the case, we can manage more business in India. And uh, besides, uh, quite recently, we formed a joint venture with Indian companies. And also, we have already uh, invested more than 150 companies in China. Now, we are working very closely. Therefore, uh, we know what is happening. Therefore, under such circumstances, ASEAN, total economic situation is uh, very good. And ASEAN and the western part of Latin America, the economic constitution is good. Then uh, we have uh, so many offices throughout the world. We are watching and uh, how to make our next business model and uh, strategy. And uh, therefore, maybe later on I can <laughs> explain some I'd be very own. interested in knowing how your strategy is changing in the, in the light of what you're saying. We'll come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, just allow Kevin, last but not least. Kevin Sneed, a new chairman. Yeah of McKinsey Asia, but with a history going back quite a long way, and things have changed enormously in the times you've been engaging with Asia. But in the present day, in the present moment, your feelings about the context? Well, I think the context, to me, was brought to life. I spent the first part of this week, I came from Italy yesterday, and I was in France and Germany uh, days before that. And if we want to sit and talk about risk and why this is an oasis, uh, meeting with a number of our client chief executives, the overwhelming sense was it is far more risky to be investing or operating in Italy, France and Germany than it is in many parts of the region that we currently call Asia. And I think that is a large part of the context. It's set by what's happening in the rest of the world. And Asia therefore is, as Victor said, an oasis. There are high expectations and clearly you have to disaggregate what we even mean by Asia. But I think there remains an overwhelming sentiment, which I think is legitimate that the growth engine of the world is here. This is what, 38% of the world's exports, 36% of the world's imports are in Asia. We have a situation in which the optimism that has renewed in terms of India and the rest of the world may give rise to expectations that are unreasonable, but nevertheless, there is an optimism. And I can see it in clients, CEOs, and investors at this point in time. In China, we debate whether it's 7.5%, 7 or 6.5%, but we're still debating that level of growth. And if we go to Japan, everybody is debating, well, is Abenomics now, the, is the third arrow going to hit? Are we going to see this maintenance of a growth trajectory that we haven't seen from Japan for a long time? And Jokowi in Indonesia, can he deliver against very high expectations? So the Asian business context is one against the rest of a world where risk is everywhere. I think people are looking at Asia to lead in terms of growth. 
And the questions I tend to get are more around how much can we trust and have confidence in China maintaining its growth rate? Do we think Asia will be able to harness the internet and digital and all the powers and opportunities it unleashes? Because actually it's being, in many respects, driven from here, not from other places. And do we think that Asian companies can continue to invest at the rate they're investing in the rest of the world? Because it's not just here where they're investing. They're driving a lot of the investment, the FDI that's going in elsewhere. So the Asian business context, I think, still remains one which is far more positive than the rest of the world. But of course, we could spend the next 45 minutes happily debating all the risks that are here. But I would argue they actually pale compared to some of the risks that you see in mature Europe and other parts of the world. It's interesting take. Let me just ask you about the importance of China maintaining its growth rate that you just said. Because for a lot of people, they'll put everything Asia in that yeah, one that category. Yeah. They'll say it all depends upon that one thing. But as our other panelists here are saying, oh, there's so much more going on that's of interest. And India's emergence is, is obviously one of them. And Li Keqiang yesterday himself said, we are now not thinking so much in terms of we must hit a growth rate anymore. Yeah. They're, they're, their own thinking is much broader. So how important is that China growth rate to you? And, and what happens if, if people begin to diversify their focus? Well, I think the growth rate matters in as much as it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of plans being made by corporations and companies on the back of assuming a certain level of growth. But let me just say a few things about that growth. China's undergoing a switch. It's no longer an investment-driven engine. It's a consumption situation. Consumer consumption is rising. The new middle class are here. There's a lot of companies making plans to target and supply into that marketplace. China's only just begun to harness the internet. The consumer internet has been harnessed. But China lags in broadband penetration, and it lags on adoption of the internet for commerce purposes by its small and medium enterprises. Those two factors together, if we can sort out the broadband, sort out the adoption of the internet on the business side, will drive at least an extra 100 basis points of GDP growth for China. So I think while the growth rate matters, there are plenty of places where you can see continuing momentum and actually increasing momentum because technology has not yet landed fully in this part of the world. Chinese companies invest about 2% on IT, the rest of the world 4%. There's a lot of room for growth still here in the existing companies. And I think that gives me reasonable grounds for optimism around the business side of the marketplace. The geopolitics, that's a different matter. Well, maybe that's something we can touch yeah. on in a moment. It's a good place to take a short break. And when we come back, I'll ask all of you to maybe engage with what the others have said. Is there anything that you've heard right now that you might disagree with? We'll be back in just a couple of more minutes. There we go. All right. Quick break. Can we have this camera on? And I'll, I'll, I'll do a welcome back. I need that camera on. <laughs> OK, here we go. Welcome back. We're talking about Asia's business context here at the World Economic Forum in Tianjin. Um, Victor, in the first half, we laid a, a, a broad groundwork of, uh, of what the context is here. And obviously, optimism is very much, I think, at the forefront of people's minds. It's human nature uh, to see the potential rather than the, the danger. But I'd just like to ask you to address one of the things uh, that David said, and that is the history of the financial crisis is something that only he touched upon. Mm. Uh, and the way we've emerged from that uh, and whether we think that's behind us. Could you just address what you think about that? I think we are much smarter uh, than before. But human nature being what it is, we, we're bound to make you know, mistakes again. But if you look at it, the financial uh, and the regulatory architecture and infrastructure is now much more solid than before. I think where um, where the the risk I see uh, more uh, imminent is, is really um, regional regional security and regional conflicts. I think if you travel around Asia and meeting uh, a lot of the policymakers, I think we, we we know what the challenges are. We know we have to go through more structural uh, reform. We know we have to make more efforts on, on to fight corruption, to increase transparency, to increase participation in, 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 in politics. Right? I think they got it, the big picture. The challenge is they must have a stability and peace background. You know, the backdrop has to be there for them to have the ability to implement these policy initiatives. So I think we, we sitting in this oasis, we have to treasure that we, we are living in a very privileged situation. The last, you know, uh, 30, 40 years has been wonderful for all of us. And, and we really have to work hard to make sure that the regional conflict can be managed. And we 
we are win-win together rather than lose-lose. I think that's where I see is the, is the most imminent danger. Let's talk about the regional politics from an alliance's perspective, if we could. Kojima san, you were talking about Narendra Modi's visit to Tokyo recently. Uh, and that, the whole um, Japan and its alliance building right now, I think, is an interesting way of looking at this. From your perspective as a businessman, where do you think the alliances could be stronger, and how do you see uh, those uh, alliances being built at a political level as well as a business one? Okay, well, talking about India, and uh, Premier Moody's uh, comment was very good because our concern the business in India was uh, state by state, regulation and uh, tax rule is uh, different. And if we are requested to you know, invest for the infrastructure and the railway cross border the you know, states, yeah. then the regulation is changing. It's very difficult for the private company to take that risk. Therefore, those countries, particularly India and the ASEAN countries in China, infrastructure business is very important for now. And we are requested to participate. And uh, Prime Minister Abe, and uh, he already announced uh, to uh, provide some uh, you know, a, uh, finance for the Indian you know, business. And the, under such circumstances, um, Premier Modi said that we are now changing the uh, uh, rule and regulations. And uh, that's good if the central government in the India has the uh, capacity to control the country. That's very good for us. Therefore, now the changing, uh, I got some feeling. Now the business chance for us to develop in India. And also, besides that, we formed a joint venture with the Indian companies. And that's also very good. And therefore, there are so many businesses throughout the world. For instance, now the very important business in the world is the shale gas. And we are working together with the Chinese company, shale gas project in Canada. These kind of things are our business model. And not bilateral, but uh, uh, the, together with China, or together with India, we will develop some business in other countries. This kind of business model is now our company's business model. But you said, you said before that your, uh, your whole trading strategy, your analysis is changing in its, uh, in its uh, nature. But when you look at this, uh, and obviously you have to lay your bets in uh, as many baskets as you can in order to minimize your risk. But in general terms, would you say that the alliances with India or China cause you more concern right now? And the important thing is the, uh, the, our employee has to say, uh, say kind of uh, knowledgeable of the country and the business field. Then uh, they can control the all business throughout the world. And it used to be just a trading company. Trading company just uh, import and export or uh, buy and sell us uh, in between and then get uh, a trading profit but uh, not our business model. Mm -hmm. We involved in the uh, investment. We understand from the, the, every industry, from upstream to the downstream, through the investment. And we have to understand what the business is, what the business uh, circumstances are changing. Then uh, how to get the, uh, you know, uh, this uh, joint venture companies more profitable and stronger. Always we are thinking about that. That is very important. Okay. And, and cutting. I think from pure business and economics perspective, uh, Prime Minister Abe's strategy of working with India rather than with, with China doesn't make sense. Why? Because China is um, four or five times the market as large as India mm. and still growing faster. And uh, the market is much, much bigger mm. in China. Mm. So work, forgetting the big market, working with the small market doesn't make sense. So I think rather the political motivation behind Pre uh, Prime Minister Abe is the, is the main reason. I think it seems to me his, his strategy is to use his uh, diplomacy, working with the Indian, working with Australia, working with the US, and also domestically revising the constitution to generate, hopefully, enough political support to push for economic changes or reforms needed for the economy. So that's a strategy of, this is my observation. Well, the, answer, the question is whether the strategy is working or not. So far, I haven't seen major success. Specifically, I haven't seen any major, major specific measures, economic measures 
domestically, dealing with the in, uh, reducing government budget, right? Dealing with uh, reducing your energy dependence upon foreign countries, therefore cutting down your your trade surplus, trade deficit right now, and also helping enterprises, your firms, go into the big markets in China. So I am a bit a bit pessimistic about the uh, prospect of the Japanese economy. Anyone want to weigh yeah. in on the issue of... I, I think it's very interesting here. <clears throat> um, I, I resonate with uh, what Kojima has said. We're doing very, something very similar. Company, businesses are already cooperating on, on a regional and multinational basis. As Kojima san said, Japanese companies with Chinese companies are cooperating in Canada, but also in the Middle East. Oh, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, we from Hong Kong, we are bringing Chinese companies to invest in infrastructure projects in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I think we already appreciate that win-win that connection. Whereas there's a bit of a mismatch on the political side. I think on business, it's much easier to build, build effective, profitable win-win alliances. And we very much hope that we can stimulate you know, more of these but is it, is, it, is it really possible in this context to separate the ideas of business and politics? I mean, it's driven by these issues. Well, it we, really is. I mean, we are. The reality is, oh, yes. is. I mean, it's made, this is a classic example of, you know, I can see something working in practice, but does it work in theory? Well, let's put the theory to one side. The reality is China's biggest investor is Japan, massive investment from Japan into China. India uh, has the benefit of a lot of uh, people looking at it now and thinking, will they invest? But I can assure you the conversations are there and the investment discussions are underway. And I think the reality is this region's opportunity, if there is one, if you just take ASEAN, is intra-Asian intra trade in ASEAN is half the levels of within Europe. I, the EU enjoys twice the level of trade amongst its members, but so it's a necessity. Uh, is, is, is that happening because of or despite the political situation? It's happening despite the political despite, situation. Yeah. So let me come in on the politics a little bit. Uh, what has characterized Asia in the past is the interaction between Asian countries, and if you take the whole span of it, is largely mediated by the West, frankly, Europe, United States. And that is what you would expect. Those were the early drivers of growth and still the largest economic zones, Europe and United States. So a lot of the politics is mediated through that. What you're seeing now, and I think that's what uh, Kojima-san was referring to, is a slight step up in bilateral. It doesn't matter which country, which two, but two, three, four, there's much more bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral interaction beginning to take place in Asia. That is very, very important because you want this cluster of countries. Yes, you talk with the entire world and, and it's a small enough world that we want all these channels to be open. But when you're the growth driver of the world, you ought to have much more direct face-to-face. Uh, -face. And we are seeing the first steps of that in the political arena and we should all welcome that because really for peace, for better economic prosperity, that's very important. But let's make a specific um, point in this, in this context, and that is ASEAN economic community. All the businessmen I've spoken to in the course of the past couple of years around Asia are saying the political vision does not match their realities, mm -hmm. uh, and they don't know what's going on. As, as, a, as a, someone who's involved in this, Kojima-san, uh, how do you view that economic community? Uh, and is the political direction adequate or irrelevant? As right. uh, therefore, say if the government support our business, that's very good. And therefore, in India case, in the, the um, Mr. Modi and the Mr. Abe, very closely communicated each other for the future, and this includes, of course, the business. And the, for the business person, we are very happy that the government people communicate to each other. Then uh, if we may have some problems uh, in the states by states, I'd like to ask our prime minister to communicate with the, uh, Mr. Moody. The, it's possible. Therefore, if the uh, government level has a very close communications, that's good. However, if now just started to make a communication level in the government, and, uh, but still the business level always communicating each other. Therefore, we have uh, so many reliable partners in China. We are always communicating. Yes. And what is the best business model? And uh, for that uh, business, our government may not uh, support us if our partner said we, we don't like to proceed the, the, those businesses. Therefore, important issue for the business uh, level, we should communicate with the uh, business level always. What is the best business model? 
And therefore, I uh, would like to develop more business, of course, in uh, China. And uh, however, for that purpose, uh, if the government announced some, uh, you know, uh, flexibility for the uh, regulation and rule, uh, that's very good. And uh, therefore, in that case, it's very surprising for uh, Premier Mr. Modi visited Japan the uh, first time, <laughs> then uh, communicated, then uh, they discussed about the, some regulation uh, will be more flexible. And uh, maybe you may know, as, as I told you, states by states, the regulation is different. But the central government announced that. That is very, very important for us to develop more business. All right. Let's take a short break and we'll be back in just a couple of more minutes uh, with some more talk about the Asian business context. Okay. All right. Start again. <laughs> and welcome back. We're talking about Asia's business context today. And uh, Kashik Basu, I just want to ask you um, about what Li Keqiang was talking about yesterday. Uh, and if we can just continue the political theme for a moment. Because um, if you didn't know who he was and you just read the text of his speech, you'd think he was uh, uh, the leader of a free market economy talking about development models. <laughs> uh, Narendra Modi went to Japan and uh, as the leader of a country which also has a historical economic model that is, is based in what you would probably, I guess, um, charitably describe as semi-free market, um, is, is talking the same sort of language. We've said it in, before the break about how you think that the business is driving the politics as much as the other way around, but I'm just wondering if you think that is the case. How do you analyze the potential for these governments to actually deliver a free market model that they're talking about because of their their political background. You know, one great shift uh, in the ideological discourse the world over is the convergence on that. We continue to use different labels. You may have a name for your party which looks very alien to the name for another party, but in terms of the core economic ideology, it's surprising how much convergence there has been, and that's what you're referring to in these various people's comments. The importance of the market is being recognized just across the spectrum. That you can't run this complex mechanism by the state taking over these decisions. You have to allow the laws of the market to function. At the same time, there's also concerns for huge inequalities and matters like that, that the government has to intervene in some strategic places. Infrastructure was mentioned. Regulation, there has to be some regulation, but it has to be a cogent regulation, countrywide regulation. This commonness of thought, space for the free market to function, at the same time, a regulatory system that enables it to, it to function well, is common across China, United States, India, Japan, and there is a lot of hope in this convergence in human thought that has taken place. And it's been a hard battle for the profession of economics getting to this point. And the politics too. I mean, from the West, they still look at this region and, and consider it as being uh, a work in progress because the, the progress they want to see is not necessarily just the free markets, but the political change too. Yes, I, I think that's a very uh, important point. Here, we used to see India and China doing different things. But the growing uh, economic and strategic interdependence uh, between these big blocks are, are really happening. I think just because Japan and India are now strengthening cooperation, there's nothing for China to fear. India and China are also reapproaching. Mm. Moody's, Mr. Moody is known to be also uh, friendly to, to, to China. From India's point of view, they have to cooperate much closer with both Japan and China. And I will bet you uh, uh, a modest sum that the biggest investor in Indian infrastructure projects will be both Japanese and Chinese. It's one thing, though, to say China should not be fearful, but it's in in reality, yeah. different. Yeah, take as young countries, for example, uh, China for the past 10 years has been very active working with ASEAN countries, doing a lot of uh, trade treaties. In fact, the, uh, the pace of, free, of uh, speeding up uh, the free trade between China and the ASEAN countries um, was ahead of schedule, actually, uh, for the past 10 years. So this is a natural reflection of the size emergence of the Chinese economy. Uh, so naturally, China is taking the lead working with ASEAN countries, but this fact 
is not widely perceived as uh, a positive development from some other countries like Japan. So this is an example of the source of uh, conflict, economic needs, right? You cannot push for a logic of China playing a more leadership role, whereas politics are preventing that from happening. Also, let me comment on the ideology issue. It's very interesting. Often, often, I often do this mental experiment. If you put together 10 economists from China, uh, together with 10 economists from the US, I bet the average or the most of the, uh, 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 the, the orientation of the economists from China is on the free market side, whereas most of the American counterparts are on the, on the left side, arguing for more government regulation, for example, with, with, with the, the Wall Street, and more redistribution. So the ideology, the economic thinking in China is actually more pro-market. The issue, of course, is to put these ideas into reaction, into, uh, into uh, reforms. That's a challenge. Well, Kanshik talked earlier on about the economists disagreeing on most things, and the old joke goes, if you laid all the world's economists head to toe, they'd never reach a conclusion. But <laughs> Let's forget, let's forget the economic aspect. From, from a, what would they say about consultants? No, well, <laughs> I was, that, that's why I'm coming to you Thank next. You. <laughs> it's like, from a consultant point of view, I guess uh, it, there's more pragmatism informs your thinking. But what of, I mean, let's take Myanmar for a case in point. I mean, all the trends that we've been talking about is evident in Myanmar. They've suddenly decided that, that this is necessary change and that the about turn has been startling. But at the end of the day, what kind of political model will survive in Asia? amidst all of these changes and these changing priorities? Well, I think it's very, I, I find it very hard to debate the political model. I think the consensus, though, on the economic model is well, striking. Look at it this and way. we cannot can, dock the Can fact business that live with a political it. model that is not Western capitalist democracy? What is Western capitalist democracy? I mean, the, the <laughs> democracy that we've question. got now, I mean, you could debate that forever. I think the point that we're all, I think, aligning around is the labels just don't help. Yesterday in the UK, most of the debate is around the breakup of the United Kingdom, inequality and in how to legislate on wage controls, dealing with a Europe that seems much more interventionist in its regulatory approach. What label do you want to give that? And so I think the reality is these labels are just unhelpful. What really matters is can Asia maintain what has hitherto driven a lot of its growth, which is an increasingly open approach to trade. And trade is leading a lot of the economic development. And I think the opportunity that Asia has hinges on the maintenance of that. Now, geopolitics may get in the way. There is no question that the political debate is absolutely relevant. But let's reflect on a few things. Look at what is happening in ASEAN rather than what is not happening. What is happening is the development of the inter-ASEAN trade is at levels that are unprecedented. It's unprecedented. It's still half the level of the European Union, but there is a lot more to go. And 2015 is an important landmark in that development. China's investment level is unprecedented. So it is driving a lot of the economics in other countries. But also have a look at what Japan has been doing and look at what India has been doing. And I think the overwhelming message here is there's no question the politics can get in the way. But the economic engine that is churning in Asia is one that's premised on trade and growth. And I think that is driving a lot of the conversation. And we can put labels around it. But the labels are just not helpful. All right. Work. So it's also premised on investment uh, in yep. infrastructure. And that investment, to a large part, is driven by governments as much as anything else. One of the themes of this forum, this uh, meeting this year, is innovation. Mika Chang yesterday was banging the innovation and entrepreneurism drum very hard indeed. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, you, you guys, what do you think is the future of innovation and entrepreneurship in Asia? And Victor, I'll begin with you. Because some 20 years ago, Kishore Mahbubani in Singapore wrote a book can Asians think? And in the, in the past, in, in, over the course of the next 20 years, the question is being asked at many forums I've been to is, can Asia innovate? Uh, the idea of generating intellectual property of its own is something that has become uh, an obsession with a lot of governments around here. So l let's begin well, there. Is I, innovation the future of Asia? I, I think the question is entirely misconceived. I mean, Japan, Korea, right, are, are, are the, the most advanced innovators in the world. China and India are the biggest consumer markets in the world. You have this dream ticket here in Asia. I hope there's some Americans in the room who might want to challenge that. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, I mean, <laughs> it's absolutely true. The numbers support this assertion because look at, the, look at where the innovation in the world is happening. In services, outsourcing, that was innovated from India and it continues to be innovated from India. Technology, 
Go tell Samsung they're not good at innovation. I mean, really? And if you have a look across the region of the internet economy, all the consumer, you know, WeChat, Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, far more adoption of consumer-led internet here than in the United States. Mm. Now, it's true that the B2B side isn't the same. So in reality, whilst that slogan, I've also heard that, innovation, that Asians can't market. They're not good at marketing. Well, that's also, have a look at the companies, Huawei, ITC. I mean, there's just a lot of innovation happening here. It may happen without the pizzazz of the Silicon Valley noise. And it doesn't happen in that way. It's true. It happens to more collective thought, but there is a lot of innovation in this part of the world. True, I uh, agree with this. But there's one level of innovation where I think Asia needs to move into, which is really the absolutely fundamental sciences. There, the dominance of the United States is very, very clear. And, I, and that does not immediately translate to next day's business strategy, but has a long-run advantage. And I feel Asia has reached a stage where that is needed. And I hope we will have the sense, because to sustain the long-run growth, the growth performance has been phenomenal over the last 20 years or so. But to sustain this, we will need the kind of research that is already taking place, Japan, Korea, really in the front line of that. But fundamental research, we need to step up so that a lot of the completely new ideas in science begin to come out, not for any chauvinistic reason, but you want this to happen in the growth-leading uh, growth region for this to take predominance as well. This is a very interesting topic, uh, talking about scientific research. Uh, I just came to realize uh, two statistics. The first is that uh, the number of patents registered in China is almost exceed the rest of the world. Almost as large as the US, I think in terms of the core, the really the innovative ones, right? Yep. And also in terms of uh, scientific publication, the things you were familiar with, and citations. China, being the second largest economy, is now very secured in second place in terms of publication in scientific journals, refereed journals, as we all know that. So that, I think, is a good sign, showing that in this region, at least in China, there is a, there's, there's, there's a fire back in the, in, in, the, in the room, which will gradually come in to drive the innovation down the road. All right, let's, let's bring in the audience here, I'm sure. Um, there's a number of people who have questions. Now, there's a, a microphone coming to you, sir. Let's. Uh... Good morning, and thank you for waking us up. That's a wonderful debate. And I have to add one, one element to this wonderful Asian business context. Uh, my question goes to my dear friend and mentor, Victor Chu. You talked about national interest or the relation between two countries or regions, but something go beyond that is threatening us, that is climate change. So what is your view of uh, Asian business context in climate, climate change? For example, today we see many scenes in industry river system, people evacuating. Mm -hmm. And Chinese bread, bread basket, Northeast Asia, northern, Northeast part of China will suffer from drought in many years to come. And even Japanese infrastructure is threatened by torrential rains. And those are huge threats. But do you see, how do you see the challenges and opportunities posed by climate change over this wonderful growing Asia? Thank, Thank you, you for bringing that subject up. Anyone else wants a question, please put your hand up and the microphone will come around. Victor. Uh, thank you for that question. I think both in our generation and our the next generation, obviously, sustain, sustainability is now really is the key word. And the alignment between politics and business is really in legitimacy. And that is really how can we deliver in order to provide you know, social impact for, for, our, for our stakeholders. So on that, on that question on climate change, I think everybody, we are, we are one world, everybody is the same is whether the particular country in their particular economic cycle can accelerate more or less to, to, the, to the agreed targets. I mean, China, uh, to, be, to be fair, is really the, probably um, walk, walking the fastest because China is uh, uh, a big, also a polluter. But the, the, the political will to get it right is there. Uh, both from the previous administration as well as the current administration. And I think you can see that in this question of climate change, we're all at one. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm grateful for you for, 
for raising that, this question. Kojima-san, very quickly, in your business, how much is climate change informing your decision making? Uh, as far as the climate change, and also the other issue is the environmental issues. And uh, say, we are very much prepared to support and uh, uh, help uh, the Asian countries. And uh, this is the kind of technologies. And uh, say, since Japan has uh, so many experiences in the climate issues and also mm -hmm. earthquake That's issues and so many things, and how to you know, uh, protect those things, uh, we are seriously studying. And this might be of some help for the Asian countries in the future. And uh, therefore, uh, just I'm talking about the infrastructure business, but also in the environmental businesses, and also how to protect those uh, climate uh, change and also uh, earthquake and uh, tsunami and so forth. Right. And we are very much experienced. That's, that's kind of uh, some help for the Asian countries, I think. OK, who has the microphone? Anyone? Behind you. Does someone actually have a microphone, or we're just we're wanting a microphone? Here. Oh, there it is. Oh, please, the, the young lady over there. I thought we'd already passed that around. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Try again. It's uh, my question is for all the guests. And uh, after the financial crisis, and uh, the United States have come up with QE, and uh, Europe has also uh, uh, put down their interest rates. And uh, everyone knows that long-term low interest rates may distorting the investment decisions and also uh, push the assets significantly high beyond its fundamentals. My question is that, given that the uh, lifting, raising interest rates in America is imminent, would that hurt uh, the fundamentals of the world economy? And uh, how Asia cope with this impact? Okay. And when we saw the first announcement of the tapering, which was last year, uh, May, there was a huge reaction. Um, uh, exchange rates across uh, the emerging economy, there were the huge depreciations. My expectation is that when the time comes, of course, uh, we are already seeing the tapering in terms of the asset purchase in the US, uh, but interest rates as well. Actually, I feel the negative impact of that is going to be smaller for the following reason. The announcement came that this is what we intend to do. And from December, we saw that uh, last December, the US moved on the tapering. But now when the tapering actually takes place, it's going to be lockstep with improvements in the American economy. So the economy strengthens, and there's going to be a little bit more tapering. And I feel the strengthening news of the United States is such good news for the rest of the world. It's still the biggest uh, driver. That that coming with the tapering is going to soften the effect of the tapering. So I'm concerned, and you have to watch. But maybe less than when there is a pure announcement without the economy having improved then what is going to happen down All the right. road? There seem to be a lot of questions, so if we can keep the questions and answers short, that'd be great. Next one, please. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'd like to know the panel's view on the impact of this debate, for instance, on growth in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Kevin, I think your company came up with a report recently indicating that with increasing improvements in governance and infrastructure, the growth in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, that has been sustained over the past decade or so, is likely going to escalate. And I think we're already seeing the response of the Chinese and to some extent the Indians in terms of massive investments into Africa, especially South Southern Africa. Recently with the uh, African summit, we see also the Americans are now also turning around and looking at the opportunities in Africa. And of course, our traditional partners, the Europeans will probably wake up to that very soon as well. Given this and given the fact that whether in fact the Asians can innovate or not, it is clear that they are going up the value chain. It is most likely that we're going to see massive investment flows from all these regions into Sub-Saharan Africa. What in the panel's view is likely going to impact the growth in Africa given the uncertainty of the political okay. situation? Thank you. Well, we are optimistic about growth in Africa for all the reasons you give. Just one place where I think China, for example, will be directly uh, relevant in this is the rising labor costs in China. <clears throat> Manufacturing costs in China continues to rise. The cost of labor is a big component of that. And you can see Chinese companies already investing and manufacturing 
in the sub-Saharan African territory. And I think that is going to continue because the pressure on wage rates in China is pretty significant. And there also is the reality of a demographic deficit. China's working population has started to shrink. People have not spent a lot of time talking about the implications of that. But the fact that China's working population is shrinking on the one hand, labor costs continue to rise on the other, it does suggest that in places like sub-Saharan Africa, the investment is going to come both in the infrastructure, which we know about, but also in the manufacturing and uh, other sides of the economy. That's right. In addition, let me add that uh, 2014 will be a landmark year in which China will have more outgoing direct investment than That's incoming. Right. And Africa is the third largest Absolutely. destination of Chinese investments. And moreover, the structure of the investment from China in, in Africa will change, moving from resources into manufacturing. Yeah. OK. Another quick question? So. I got a very quick question to Professor Li. You talked about the uh, Chinese leadership uh, uh, toward the ASEAN countries. What's the vision of Chinese leadership vis-a-vis uh, -vis ASEAN countries, particularly in terms of uh, vision, in terms of value? I think the vision is very simple. That is to integrate economically uh, ever closer with the ASEAN countries and in the process uh, work closely on the uh, political diplomatic relations. In this, don't forget, these countries have a lot of traditional uh, Chinese business investors. And historically, there are a lot of ethnic Chinese uh, living and mi migrating to this region. Another quick question. Hands, please. Anyone? Who? Oh. Others. Oh, <clears throat> Sorry, Christophe Duchatelier from ADECO. I would like to have your point of view uh, regarding the uh, issues, regard challenges about aging populations and war of talent in Asia. Anyone care to address aging population? Well, this is, I mean, obviously <laughs> in Japan, we could spend a lot of time yeah. talking about it, but China has the same factors going on. The average age in China, if you look at what's happening to median age, it's already 39. It's heading north rapidly. And I think as a result, the question, it creates is both how you make sure that the productivity issue and stop relying on young, low-cost labor and shift up the value chain, as was just said, but also how we innovate to meet the needs of those aging consumers because it creates a big opportunity. And I think Chinese companies are not yet fully grasping that opportunity in the way that countries, companies coming from the US and others have done so. So the working age and the opportunity that therefore creates is actually both a threat on the one hand, I think, on the manufacturing side, but it's also an opportunity on the innovation side. Mm -hmm. and they need to get after it. But governments are going to have to also innovate to ensure that they can deliver services at far lower cost. And if they don't do that, then there's going to be a real problem because the dependency rates are all going in the wrong mm -hmm. direction. Well, aging problem is a very serious problem for Japan. Also, we have a problem of the uh, uh, reduction of the populations. And under such circumstances, and the working people, the total population is now decreasing. And, uh, when I went to the, uh, the Philippines, the Philippines said, uh, Philippines has the, uh, now almost 100 million people there. And uh, Japan is uh, 100, uh, 130 or something like. And uh, the Philippines is now still increasing a lot. And the average age is uh, 20 years old, 22 years old or something. Therefore, and uh, we have to collaborate with the ASEAN countries and uh, to protect our aging <laughs> problem and also the reduction of the total populations. Yeah. And uh, this is a very important uh, problem for us and uh, try to, say, resolve this problem right. and uh, collaborating with the uh, ASEAN people and, and the Chinese people and the Indian people, of course. To put, a, to put in a quick word on this, on the demographics, there are general concerns Asia-wide. India is still on the dividend yeah. slope. Yes. And the expectation is it's going to peak in 1933-34. So it's going to get younger up to then and then turn around. Mm -hmm. And given that the economy is growing very well, actually this augurs very well that it's going to feed in and take in this labor and give it a growth push. But on that, the biggest hope is really with Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the demographic dividend is going to be very large in terms of the age bulge, if the governance and the economy can be got into place, then you are going to draw on this and become a major driver. Okay. We have very reached quickly. the end. A final word from yeah, David. Very quickly, two very important issues people tend to forget when discussing aging. Number one is people are getting healthier when they are older. Controlling the age, people are much healthier than 20 years ago. Second, 
the per capita income in a country like China when people are still poor, whereas they are, meanwhile, they are getting healthier. If the policies are flexible enough to encourage them to work, then the aging issue can be greatly mitigated, specifically encouraging old but healthy and still poor people to work. And there we are going to have to leave it. Gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. The audience, thank you. Please show your appreciation for our panel.